Well, good evening, good evening, good evening, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of He Said, He Said, He Said, a look at the world from a seasoned Black man's perspective. I'm your host, Alvin King, and welcome to this Friday, January the 13th, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are so glad that, that you are here. We have a special, special show tonight for all of you. Uh, we have with us Tenem T. West, the executive director of the LGBTQ Institute, the Center for Civil and Human Rights out of Atlanta. And uh, he has, is joining us tonight, ladies and gentlemen. He has had a very, very busy week, of which we're going to tell you about that. But um, he is here, and we cannot wait to have our, a conversation with him. L let me ask you, though, um, how many of you knew that there was an LGBTQ institute, first of all? Um, I know that until I started doing my research, I, I, I didn't know. Um, I have uh, known... Timim Tim him for quite a long time, and I'm telling you, he is the right man for the job. So we're looking uh, for wonderful things from him. Uh, let me see. Secondly, how many of you have taken down your Christmas decorations? Any of you? I have. I the the way I deal with that is I typically wait until they talk about taking down the, uh, the tree at, at uh, Rockefeller Center. And they're going to do that this weekend. So I, I came in, 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 in here today and I said, I'm going to get rid of all this. It was a lot of work. And I thought, if only I had somebody to do this for me. And then I thought, let me go and buy a lottery ticket. Uh, I hope you all know that tonight is the Mega Millions jackpot, speaking of lottery tickets. And it is $1,350,000,000. I think you can buy three or four people to take down your Christmas tree with that kind of money. But I hope that you have your ticket and I hope that you all are winners or at least someone who knows me and loves me is a winner tonight. Um, because if you win, I'm definitely going to be calling you. So um, look at your tickets after 11 o'clock tonight. On a sad note, uh, I'm sure many of you have heard, but Lisa Marie Presley, uh, she passed away on yesterday. She is the only daughter of uh, Elvis Presley. She, again, she was 54 years old and she died of a heart attack. And what's really, really crazy, um, she was just at the Golden Globes the other night and um, Austin Butler, who played Elvis in the movie, he, he gave her and uh, her mom credit for helping him get through that, that, that part of, um, you know, get through the, that role. And two days later, she's passed away. So we want to uh, send up prayers for the Presley family because we know that, that this is a very, very hard time for them. Well, like I told you, we have a wonderful show, ladies and gentlemen, for you tonight. And if you all are ready for the chat, I'm certainly ready because I haven't seen my guys in a week. So ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready for the chat, please. What up, what up, what up? Hey, hey what's up, guys? Hey, <laughs> what's going on, fellas? It's good to see you. It's good to see y'all. Happy Friday, as they say. Friday the 13th. Yes. We have true. great luck of being together. We don't have, we don't, we are not a superstitious, superstitious crew. No, no. And after two years of what we've been through, Friday the 13th is just another day. You better you know tell us about it. It is just another day. Oh, wait a minute. I'm I, doing I, the Wednesday dance to Friday the 13th. Oh, you wow. did what? <laughs> I'm doing the Wednesday oh, dance. Wednesday on the, uh, the uh, show on, uh, is it Hulu or Netflix? But it's the takeoff yeah. of the Adams Family. Yes, yes. Wednesday. Yeah. Wait a minute. Y'all, look, look. First of all, before we get into look at all these folks that are online that we got to holler at. Folks look at are this. Hollering. They're hollering. Rose is here, Blue is here, Terry hey, is Terry. here. Hey, Terry. Hey, Blue. Terry. Hey, Rose. Monica, George. Uh, Folks are there. Hey, what's up? How you guys doing? You guys take down your Christmas tree yet? Hey, George. Would you put one up? <laughs> you take down your Christmas tree? So what's been going on, fellas? You guys had a great week? 
I did. And I'm telling you, I have not taken down my Christmas decorations and I'm not going to because I have, I'm looking at it, my window. There's a string of white lights that I yeah. put in yeah. and I also have plants there and the plants are thriving because now they get six hours of extra sunlight. Of I have light. a Gabara daisy that is now blooming like crazy and wow. it's not blooming for a year. So there you they're go. staying well, I guess they're not. I, ne I did not put a tree up this year. I put decorations around the house. So I didn't put a tree up. So and some of those are down, but not put away yet. So they're just out of view of this camera right now. But <laughs> but they're still around. <laughs> so I'm just gonna own it for what it is. If if I were to turn this computer around, you'd be like, oh Lord, what is all that stuff? So yeah. Well, Terry said he didn't put one up, and I happen to know George Pringle. George Pringle probably has like four Christmas trees in his house. Okay, uh, George so, said, uh, you know my tree is still up. From over the <laughs> years. <laughs> he just has, you know, three or four Christmas trees. But um, guys, you know, again, it, it has been a crazy week. So Busy. much has been going on, as always. Yep. And, you know, we, we try to keep up the best we can. But, you know, I, I thought, you know, tonight, I mean, the Golden Globes this year, I mean, come on. They, they, they. I think the, you know, because they got so much, have gotten so much flack about not having, you know, a, a representation yeah. or yeah. diversity. I mean, I'm not going to say they went overboard because the um, people who won, it was well-deserved. But um, if you guys, I, I want to give some credit to some of the, the winners um, yeah. th th this year. So I want to start off first with um, our girl, your girl, Angela Bassett, you know, at 64 years old. Wakanda forever. She, <laughs> Wakanda forever. She won for best performance um, in a supporting role, and actually, it was a, she made history because there's never been a, a Marvel character ever that has won, you know, a, an award of this magnitude. So, you know, kudos to Angela Bassett, and uh, this is one of my new favorite actresses right now, Miss Jennifer Coolidge. She was in White Lotus, and if you guys haven't seen that, um, she won best actress. Um, and best miniseries or for best miniseries or TV film. She won both of those titles that night and um, she just knocked it out the park. And you know, for all of you who may know Bette Midler, does she not remind you of Bette Midler? There are some, oh. yeah, there's some resemblance. Oh, what are you there. saying? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> Bette, Bette, you know Bette, Bette Midler had that, that kind of, you know, yeah. kind of thing. I, I don't know if she can sing or not because Bette Midler's talented. I'm not taking that anything away from you, Miss Midler. But, but I anyway, have to tell you, I the thing I remember most about her though is if you if you saw her in Legally Blonde is the bend and snap. Yeah, remember? <laughs> yeah, I remember. I remember. Yeah. she has come a long way, baby. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. She has. Yes, she has. Well, it was not just a night for black people mm -hmm. because you know we always hear about how the Oscars and the Golden Globes are so white. This year, they gave us a little bit of a rainbow mm. because Michelle Yeoh won for Best Actress in a Film for Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. And her speech touched me so much because at one point during her speech, she said, for all the people who look like me, yeah. this is possible. And I cheered because you yeah. know, so often we hear Black people say that because you know we're not necessarily as represented. But I was like, you know what? Our Asian brothers and sisters are not represented either. So good right. for you, Michelle Yeoh. And I That's love cool. her. She's, you know, if you haven't seen the film, it's also really spectacular. Awesome. It is very awesome. Yeah. 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 Right. And speaking of everything, everywhere, all at once, Kiwe Kwan also won for best. Was it best? It was best supporting actor, if I'm I not mistaken. I think it yeah. was best support. I think it, it was be be right? best supporting actor. And hold on, you know what? If you keep going, I'll, I'll follow back because you know I brought my little sheet here. I know you, you know, know because you because they they let me vote, but I had to leave that night. So um, that's so I'm, fantastic. I'm gonna go ahead and watch. I'm gonna go ahead and so but, Bobby, you, you can but go his speech also forward. extremely touching mm -hmm. because he really hasn't worked that much since he was the young child actor in the Indiana Jones film. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yep. That's right. Yep. That's right. That's and right. between Michelle Yeoh mm -hmm. and him, I, you know, look, I'm like, look, I'm all, all in. team Asian. Yeah. I, you Kudos. know, like, look, diversity everywhere, all around. She's also representing 60 something. So I love Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Love it. They, love it. They also saluted Hollywood it girl right now, Quinta Brunson the creator and star of Abbott Elementary, 
the, the mockumentary sitcom, which is what they, that genre that it, that it falls under, that looks at uh, public school teachers and navigating public school life in Philadelphia. Uh, Quinta is on a roll. Obviously, many of you saw that uh, Shirley Ralph has also won an award uh, for her performance and her, mm -hmm. uh, her work on the show as well. But Quinta Brunson is like Miss It Girl. If you didn't see the interview that she did with uh, Oprah Winfrey, it was a one hour sit down interview that I'm sure you could Google as well that gives some really powerful insight uh, about her talent, but also her, her humility as well. She really comes across as a very humble, yet very talented and hardworking young woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see, we also had Tyler James Williams, who also was on Abbott Elementary, who many of you may remember from his time, starring in the Chris Rock-inspired uh, sitcom, Everybody Hates Chris. Everybody uh, hates Chris. Everybody hates Chris. Everybody so, hates you know, uh, again, uh, Abbott Elementary is on this roll right now. It very much reminds me of the situation that Modern Family was in at one point. Like, if you're up against them, you you know it's, it's, it's not looking good for you. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, so we want to uh, congratulate him as well. Are they well, going to have a sequel, Everybody Slaps Chris? Uh, okay, you know what? You better go ahead and take a I'm sip. Sorry, no, go they're, not gonna, they're not going to do it. Um, <laughs> he's, 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 out, out, he's out the gate, folks. He's out I'm the gonna, gate. The, 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 these next two folks, uh, one, Mr. Uh, Austin Butler, who played Elvis. Again, he he uh, talked to Lisa Marie um, or acknowledged her you know, at the Golden Globes. I think this is the guy to look out for. He is not a person of color, but I think he is a great actor, and I think he is he has he embodied the character. I thought he was great. And then Zendaya, my girl, a couple of weeks ago, she was my 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 fashion. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, Maven. Maven. Um, yes. And so she won for best performance um, in a TV drama series for Euphoria. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The nice. Golden yeah. Globes also honors gives two large awards for overall achievement. This year, the Cecil B. DeMille Award went to Edward Reagan Murphy, who many of us know as Eddie Murphy. It was given to him for outstanding contributions to the world of entertainment. At 61 years old, Eddie Murphy is still out there uh, knocking it out and being uh, uh, rewarded for his longstanding career. We all know him from Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live, which was his start. But we also recognize his work through movies and comedy shows and so forth. So it's really good to see him uh, receive those accolades. There was also another large award, the Carol Burnett uh, Award for Achievement, which was given to Ryan Murphy. And many of us know Ryan from his work with Glee and Pose and American Horror Story. And uh, Ryan's uh, acceptance speech was profound it was uh, in being yeah. able to lift yeah. up the names and voices and faces of people that he did not see represented when he was growing up. He's, he's made it um, his work to kind of uplift many of the marginalized communities in his work uh, and to highlight them. He also gave um, a, a very special spotlight to MJ Rodriguez, who, who was not able to really receive full accolades for her being groundbreaking and being a transgender woman receiving a high level uh, last year last year. exactly right last and, and, year right and because it was not uh in person right. she really didn't i mean she got her accolades obviously but not standing up and all of that and he highlighted that it was just a really really wonderful mm -hmm. to see this man mm -hmm. who was being given this high award also uh, uh pass along some flowers to others as well yeah. yeah, he I thought I thought he did a, his speech was incredible. I agree with you, Bobby. And last but not least, uh, one of the main persons on the stage uh, on at the Golden Globe was uh, Jared Carmichael. I'm going to tell you, I love me some Jared Carmichael. I love me some Rothan. What's the Rothaniel? I love. <laughs> but I just thought that um, he missed he missed the mark a, as a host this um, this year. And I really felt bad for him at times, um, but that, that's just my, my opinion. Um, I, I was really looking for more mm. and it didn't, it didn't come, you know, that way. I'm not going to bash dude because sometimes you got to go through something so that you can be better, yes. you know? And so I'm, I'm taking that route, but that, that's my opinion on Jared Carmichael. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Well, yeah. we have people who have joined us and have been chiming into the conversation. Uh, Terry said that Ms. Bassett was flawless Hollywood glamour. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Deshaun Fraud said, Hotep or Peace? And uh, how can he be a guest in the future? We got a hello from rainy California as well mm -hmm. in there. Hey, Judy. 
Um, and she asked us, what do we think of Billy Porter's uh, tuxedo dress? I thought it was redundant. Like I thought he had already done a tuxedo experience to come back with it again, just in a different color and not the hoop skirt showed a lack of creativity and he was my fashion maverick. So I was slightly disappointed. I agree to disagree. I thought it was really beautiful. One, Brian Murphy, I mean, Ryan Murphy had asked him to, to recreate, like to actually, you know, recreate it in, in some kind of creative way. Christian Soriano uh, took that same look and added, it was a very slender mm -hmm. column in the middle still with the, the, mm -hmm. the full skirt and a very completely different color to go from black to the pink. Um, it was a lot of outfit, but I had an appreciation for it and, and did not see it as uh, necessarily being redundant, but uh, re, re envisioned. And if you guys are ready, whatever. I'm going to, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how we are. I'm like, that's what I'm doing. If you guys are ready, I think it's time for us to bring in our special guest. Oh my God. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, because, because you all have said a mouthful. Okay, and I I'm think I'm going to take the high road. Let's agree I to think, disagree. He's like, I heard whatever. a yay and a nay. So I if think, you guys I think ready, we can perhaps maybe talk a little bit more amongst ourselves. Yeah. If you don't mind. If I'm talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> just because there's, um, you know, things left unsaid and people not in the studio. Well, that's true. So... That's, true. That's, true. <laughs> that's true. But I will so... say, though, that I, I, I wanted to just quickly go back to Jared Carmichael. Um, I, I kind of now, while I, I did not completely agree with my co-host, Vash, I will agree with Alvin. Mm -hmm. On Jared Carmichael. I was like, I, I thought that he began strong and really kind of like, naming the elephant in the room and talking about uh, the shots that have been taken at the Golden Globes for their lack of diversity and inclusion and all of that. But I found his hosting lackluster. I, it, felt, um, it felt like he was literally just reading what was in front of him and sometimes even questioning what he was reading as if it were the first time that, that he was reading it. And we won't even begin to get into his fashion. No, we we, 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 we we won't do that because we'll we'll need another talk show for that. <laughs> um, so so you guys I, and and thank you for that, Bobby and Vaj, for you know for that commentary on our Golden Globe uh, winners, ladies yep. and gentlemen. Yep. Um, so and thank you, Samuel. So what we need to do, we, we need to get on and bring our special guest on, ladies and gentlemen. So let me introduce him. Uh, Tim M. West is a pioneering author, poet, educator, and hip hop artist who can be best described as a renaissance man, leveraging a broad and diverse set of skills and interests to advocate for marginalized communities. Until very recently, for the past eight and a half years, he served as senior managing director for Teach for America's National Prism Alliances, which advances safer and more supportive classrooms for students and their educators. He's a graduate of Duke, the new school, and Stanford University, and Timim spent perhaps his most formative undergraduate year at Howard University as an, <laughs> as an exchange student in 1993. On Monday of this week, you all, Timim became the executive director of the LGBTQ Institute, the National Center for Civil and Human Rights in Atlanta. He is giving up his first live interview on our show in his new role and will give us a live performance at the end of the show. So don't go away, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome to the He Said, He Said, He Said stage tonight, our special guest, Tim M. West. Hey, everybody. Hey, Tim M., how hey, you Tim doing, man? Man? <laughs> Before we begin, though, we do want to let people know that Tim M. has been having some technical difficulties. He's, he's that doesn't have the strongest connection right now. So he's really, you know, it, should there be a technical glitch, we know he'll come right back in there, so. I think it's this Aubrey Hepburn thing behind me in Friday the 13th <laughs> doing some kind of EBGB on me, so. so, so well, since you pointed that out, we should know that you're not at home right now. Like, like that, is, that is not your art that's behind you. It is not. 
and <laughs> I'm gonna leave Are you in a hotel or I'm gonna Airbnb? Go. <laughs> you know what? Okay, okay boss, no, no one Tim was gonna go there. Okay. Okay, here, here we go. Oh, Tim, thank you for, for being here tonight. And you know what? The, the, this panel is on, I'm saying 100. Tim, do me a favor. First of all, congratulations. Yes. On your new role. And just take about 60 to 90 seconds in your words to tell us who is Tim M. West? Goodness. Um, that's quite a bit. You know, at, <laughs> at the root of who I am, I am a preacher's kid, that uh, Cincinnati born, uh, grew up and was raised mostly in Arkansas, uh, between Little Rock and a small country town on the Louisiana state line named Taylor. Um, I am a philosopher by training, so most of my degrees and even what I studied at Howard was philosophy. Um, I'm an artist and a creative. So that's who I am. And I think for a long time, I felt I had to choose a pathway, right? Are you going to be the activist? Are you going to be the artist? Are you going to be an intellectual? And I think my journey and the example that I, sh I shaped for so many others is that you can do all those things, right? You can be good at a lot of different things and it can really open pathways. I remember telling my mom that I was going to uh, study philosophy in college. And she looked at me like, what are you going to go do? Think on a mountaintop or something? Uh, because that's what we say, right? Our black right. kids have to be engineers or doctors mm, or right. these certain types of professions. And yet, you know, I live a life that I'm joyful about. I'm happy to go to work. I'm excited about the, the work that I get to do. And, and so I think, you know, that's been the journey is right now I'm in a position to kind of leverage my artistic stuff, my intellectual stuff all together to, to get people free. That's 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 my life's passion and that's my work and it's rooted in my my personal experience as a black person, uh, as a as a queer and same gender loving person. Uh, all of that's wrapped up in there. Thank you, thank you, Tim. Thank you. Okay, all right. Right on, right on. I, I, I love I love most. That's all of that. That's really great. So for those of us who don't know about the LGBTQ Institute at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, will you fill us in on what the institution is and what it's all about? Yeah. So interestingly enough, a lot of people know the National Center for Civil and Human Rights as a museum, right? In 2014, uh, through the support of a lot of donors and grants, they opened a center that largely held a lot of the, like the King Papers, um, a lot of artifacts from the civil rights movement and history in Atlanta. So when you go into the museum, it, it shows you two, two Americas, uh, a white America and a black America. And interestingly, they look pretty equal. Right. You have the black debutantes and the white debutantes. Mm -hmm. And as you go through, you see how division and, 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 and Jim Crow and all those other things actually work to destabilize a lot of the strength that we had in black communities um, through uh, a, a lunch counter where you literally get to sit at a lunch counter and put on headphones and experience the jeers and taunts and, and racial epithets of white racist saying things. And I know I can never stay on that seat more than 30 seconds before wow. I'm like, can't do it. Like, it's just, it's a triggering thing, but it also gave me a deep sense of appreciation for what our ancestors did. I, there's a shirt I used to see that that some younger people would wear saying, uh, dear, dear white people, I'm not my ancestors. And I, I always felt that was very offensive mm -hmm. because when you go through a moment like that, I'm like, I don't think I could have done it. Like, I don't, I don't know that I have the fortitude, the the patience, the mm -hmm. the courage to en endure what so many of them did. And so I think it's a it's a real visceral experience. I think one of the other experiences there is hearing the the the, the scream when they announced that King died. Um, you know, uh, when they announced it, I think it was Walter Conkrider, I don't know, one of those people that my grandma talked about, announced that King had been had been shot. Mm -hmm. And you just see this, you hear this this sigh. And just to mm -hmm. think about the enormity and the magnitude of someone uh, who, who represented so much for people being, being mm -hmm. murdered, right, uh, is something. And then we go into the human rights aspect and all over the world, connecting the civil rights movement in America to uh, the national and international human rights issues that... Uh, that are covering what's happening with women in Iran or what's happening with LGBTQ rights in, in Russia or in Senegal. So it's a really, it's a great experience. I think being at the center for me though, is about moving from the spectacle of the center being this place where you go have an experience mm -hmm. to what do you do after you leave? Uh, okay. And I think a lot of our museums, I think the museum at the Smithsonian in, in DC, uh, a lot of people can have these experiences where they go, they experience 
you know, the, 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 I mean, the, this moment, but then mm-hmm. I don't think that we do a good enough job of navigating people to where they can position themselves to actually create systemic change. And so I think I'm there in part to really help guide um, the National Center for Civil Human Rights first to see that like LGBTQ rights are human rights, right? Mm-hmm. And I think we need to reframe uh, our rights as queer and trans people as human rights. If I'm not able to get a job because I'm married to a guy, that's a human rights issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think what they what people want to do is continually, um, you know, pigeonhole and 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 put that aside as an LGBT issue so that people can say we want special rights. Well, no, we want human rights. I want to be able to get a job just like you. I want to be able to move in the neighborhood that I want to just like you. And so I think that's an important thing for us to begin to, to do. And I think that's that the institute is an institute inside of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. So we, we do other things, but when it comes to LGBTQ folks, that is my lane. Okay. Right. Well, Tim, you are so gracious to join us at the end of your first full first week. week. <laughs> in this. So you get to Friday, it's time for you to get off and here you are with us. And so we really want to say thank you for that. I, you kind of answered what I was going to ask you in terms of some of your objectives and so forth. So mm-hmm. I'm going to shift a little bit and just say, okay. so at the end of this first week then, what, if it, was there any revelation about, about you now being in this position that, you know, speaks to some of those objectives or that you hope to accomplish with anyone not surprise necessarily, but a revelation in this first week, now that one week is under your belt. And congratulations again on that. Yeah, I think it was an affirmation that I'd been offered other opportunities to lead at the executive director level and it just didn't feel right. Uh, And it it didn't feel like the right time. So one of the affirmations was that, um, I think sometimes as, as, as black people that are at the intersections of a lot of marginalized identity, we're very hard on ourselves, right? We, we grow up with people telling us you got to be three and four times better than the yeah. better of a person in order to make it. Yeah. And I think we can sometimes internalize that mm-hmm. in such a way that we're like incredibly difficult, uh, incredibly hard on ourselves. And I think I was able to step into conversations with CEOs at other organizations and executive directors at other organizations that said, Tim and we are so excited that you are there. And so I think the checkpoint for me was like, how can I begin to to internalize that, right? That I am the right person at the right moment for the job and shed some of that sort of, uh, you know, imposter syndrome that I think a lot of talented black people deal with. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And then the other revelation is that, you know, a lot of this stuff is interconnected. Um, I think I was watching an NFL game and there was some commercial that kind of surprised me in the middle, but it sort of talked about white supremacy. Mm-hmm. And that if you look at a lot of white supremacist rhetoric, they're after the black people, they're after the Jewish folks, they're after LGBTQ, they're after immigrants. But so often we find these ways to not sort of mobilize uh, around the common enemy. And I think that that, to me, is is a direction that I want to go in, is using empathy as a lever for us to be able to see the humanity in each other uh, in order to act collectively to turn things around. Thank you. Well, I'm going to tell you, you, first of all, you have me, when I get off the phone, I just wrote myself a note to, you know, uh, look into getting a plane ticket so I can come to Atlanta to to come to the LGBTQ uh, Institute. You've already sold me on that. So... And I want to give y'all the tour. So, like, make sure y'all plan it, and I'll be there, and I will give you the tour because you'll get the Tim version. Uh, you know what? Okay, then we we really have to plan that, guys. Okay, you heard I'm it. Say, don't make okay. a promise that you're not going to. Okay, because we, 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 we are coming. <laughs> you know, one, one of the interesting things, Alvin, that uh, and I knew this, but I didn't figure out who Bayard Rustin was until mm. I was in graduate school, mm-hmm. and I think about so many black LGBTQ people who were so fundamental to the civil rights movement, but whose experiences and identities were pushed to the side because they were LGBTQ. Absolutely. And so I think like to be able to amplify that, like, you know, we are one black family trying to make it, you know, in this country and yeah. we have to find that solidarity. Well, we, we're, def- we're definitely coming. So Tim, I want to ask you, yes, how, how important is community in both your personal and professional life? Oh goodness, I you know I grew up with eight siblings, so I would say my 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 idea of community started in my family. Uh, my my father was not a wealthy 
you know, minister who had a big church or mega church or anything. We, he was a storefront preacher and many occasions, uh, half the congregation was my family. We were the choir, the drummers, the testimony, you know, the usher board, the usher board, what do you call it? You were the usher board? The usher, the usher, the usher board. board. We, were, we were all of them, right? All right? And so I think, you know, that sense of family, that sense of community for me, I really struggled when I left for college because for 17 years of my life, I had had people around me all constantly, all times of the day. And so I think when I talk about the importance of community. It's like really trying to replicate that in other spaces. So when I, you know, some people say, well, you're so friendly to everybody. I'm like, well, I, I think it's important to connect. Mm. And I can't advocate for somebody I don't connect with that I don't know. And so I think it's really important for us to, you know, humble ourselves. And, and, and I see that, you know, I found community at tracks. I found community at the bachelor's meal. I found community at the Delta. Like it's not even just our formal spaces of convening, it's it's book clubs. I was a book club in DC that I read my book to and, and had a conversation with those brothers. It's bus boys and poets, it's the friend groups that we have. And I think that that's important because the, the better a sense that we have of community, the more experiences we can lean into and advocate for people that are different than us. Um, and that's why people don't have to share every aspect of my identity for me to be able to actually say, you know what? I feel that and I'm gonna work on your behalf so that we can actually live into the principle of liberty and justice for all people, uh, you know, here in America. Tim, I mean, you mentioned the um, the importance of humility and acting with mm -hmm. humility, and how that's necessary for you to be able to advocate for others. Can you tell us when you knew that being an advocate was something that was a part of your future? Yes, uh, and this is a really odd example, but I was in Little Rock, Arkansas. We had gone on a field trip to Nelson Potato Chip Factory. Um, I think the week before, around that time, my family, my dad, my dad was a storefront preacher, but he was also kind of an advocate, you know, mm -hmm. Afro-Latchian guy. For people that don't know, that's black people in Appalachia. They are called Afro-Latchian. Um, so he's and, a Kentucky. And I thought you said Afro-Latin, and I was like, "Oh, from what they use, Afro-Latin." I'm so glad you did that. Okay. We need our producer to put that to spell that out and put it up on the okay. screen. Okay. Afro-Latin. Got it. There are actually books and things about that. He's from Harlan County, Kentucky, and okay. so you know, gr gritty people. But I think you know, for for me, and I kind of lost sight of the question. Mm -hmm. This uh, this advocacy. I remember yes, being there, you, yeah, that and they asked. They said, yeah. "Well, who knows? Who knows where we are?" And I was sitting there like, "Well, that's obvious, right?" Because like, <laughs> I knew where the field trip was. Uh, but at that time, we, my dad, we were featured in the the Little Rock Gazette or some some Arkansas Gazette, some paper, because our house did not have heat for the winter. And I remember growing up at, at an early age, experiencing poverty. I remember walking with my mom through the streets at one point in South Dallas, um, you know, trying to, my mother was literally asking people if we could stay for a night. Mm -hmm. And so, but I remember, and this comes full circle, saying Nelson Potato Chips Factory. And the guy was like, and you get a prize. And he gave me this big bag of chips. Mind you, it wasn't super heavy, but it literally took up my entire body. So I'm walking down the street after school, with my big bag of Nelson potato chips. And, and I'm so happy because I'm like, my family gets to have something to eat tonight. Mm. And I have this, this band of kids like cheering and they're, they're behind me. Now people don't see those moments as advocacy, but I think I made a connection, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. that, that speaking up for yourself, that speaking truth to power can sometimes yield things that can help you provide, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I learned little lessons like that over and over again that like, how can I use my voice to get the things that we need? And I, my mother would say that that was probably the moment too. Like thereafter, I found ways to leverage my voice to um, to create space for me. I was a little activist like in third grade. It was, it's, it's kind of funny. <laughs> you were an activist at Tracks. Okay, I just want you to know I, I was, that. I was that. I, I, was, I, I, I was gonna leave that alone, but. You, 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 you were, you were. That, I, I, I met the, the early activists. Early yeah. got Yes, it. I did. Yes, I did. Got it. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, speaking of your activism work, mm -hmm. I, I know you're working at the LGBTQ Institute, and I'm an intersex activist. 
for those of you who have not seen my shirts, keep calm, they're intersex. Uh, one of the things I'm always advocating on this particular show is that we always use the acronym LGBTQI. I think talking about intersex people helps expand the, the understanding of who we all are as human beings. So I kind of want to know, one, uh, what do you plan on doing as part of this institute to help advocate for intersex people? And then you also use same gender loving to describe yourself. And I just have a question. Are you open to dating trans men? So it's interesting. I identify in a lot of different ways depending on my context, right? Okay. So I, I'm okay with queer. I'm okay with same gender loving. I'm okay with both gender loving. I, I sexually, I'm pansexual. So I like what I like. I are. have dated, I've dated men of trans experience. I've dated women of trans experience. I've dated men and women. So that's just kind of the breadth of, of who I am. And it actually took me accepting first that I like men to actually open up to some of those other identities. And I think that's why the term queer for people that are younger tends to work. It's like, what does that mean? It's like, well, it means I'm not heterosexual, but don't assume anything else. Right. And I think people find that it's an identity that puts me outside of the norm, but I don't want to be boxed. Right. right. Uh, and so I think that's how a lot of people think, think of that. But I also know when I go to my mom's in Arkansas, I'm gay. Mm -hmm. Right. Like the same gender loving, mm -hmm. like that. And so I think it's about how do you identify in a way that allows other people to connect to your story? Mm -hmm. And if I'm so stubborn about being this particular term when I'm around family and it prevents us from connecting, I don't think that's productive. I'm not. That's part of the humility. I don't you know, if you need to call me gay, that's fine. I'm, I'm OK. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I'm curious because when people use that term, it has implications, et cetera. So I just want to make sure that when people are using it, that they're not just being internally homophobic, that they're right. actually using it in a way that is actually expressive. So again, I want to get back to what are you going to be doing yes, at this institute intersex. with intersex and expanding that eye? Right. So, so one of the things I'm, I'm doing at first is I'm, I'm actually, you know, re, relaunching and rebuilding a board. So the institute it has an advisory board, mostly people across the South. And one of the things that um, I think we need to make sure is that there are people that are on that board who are of intersex experience. I actually have a few people in mind that I know have been doing activism for a long time. I also think that like the eye is something that is so critical to the attacks that are happening now. Mm -hmm. um, we were taught gender wrong. Yes. And that's really hard for people to accept. And sex. Yes, we were taught gender wrong. We were taught sex wrong. And so when you look at the reality that like what we think of as sex is like being what's down there and we're not thinking about chromosomes or hormones or we're taught that they're XX and XY chromosomes. No, there are a multitude of combinations of chromosomes and hormones that determine where somebody may fit. You know, not all women are super feminine. Right. You can take women as a category and you will see a full range from the most masculine to the most feminine. Same with males, same with people in between. And so I think part of it is like re-educating us that like when we when we find out that some person is trans or intersex, that that is one, it's natural, right? Because if you say like, you know, God only made men and women, well, then that's not true because there are people with both traits that are born that way. Right. And so I think it's it's really about an, a re-education moment. And it's also about understanding our privilege as cisgender people. Right. So I present and show up in the world as a cisgender black you know, queer man. Right. But I also know that there are spaces I get to be in and speak in because of that, because people are very comfortable with the comfortable. way I show up, right. but they may not accept my effeminate friend mm -hmm. who, you know, got a, more than a little sugar in his tank. Right. 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 And so part of it is like, how can I create and open up spaces for other people? Um, you know, one example of that is that the, the, the work that I led at Teach for America is now led because of my mentorship and my advocacy by a non-binary uh, trans person of mm -hmm. color. You know, and that was important because I'm like, through my advocacy and work, I can open the door to someone else who can be in that space. But it's really about opening doors and accepting that we all have points of privilege. Right. How are we using our privilege right. to open the doors for other people? And I think so often, and it's sad to me, some of the most transphobic people I know are gay men. Right, oh, how about that? Tim, I wanna, I wanna ask you a question that um, I, I think that 
it is personal, but I know that you've been very open about this and I think you can help somebody. Um, you've been very public about your HIV positive status. Can you speak about some of the challenges and also opportunities of being open about that information? Whew. Um, you know, I was a poster boy pretty early on. And in part, I was kind of forced into a situation. I was facilitating a, a youth group in Oakland. And the question came up. I had just tested positive maybe a month before. And someone asked, what would you do if you found out you were positive? Hmm. And I literally had to sit there and hear suicide method after suicide method. I'll jump from the Golden Gate Bridge. I'll find the nearest gun. I'll hang myself. And I'm sitting there as a leader of this group saying, my goodness. Like, I can't let them leave the room thinking that that's what you do when you find out that you're positive. Mm. And so I made a decision in that moment that like, you know what, I wasn't going to hide it. Because people have that attitude, you know, you can see a Magic Johnson, you can see a wealthy person, and you don't connect with that. They're a celebrity, they get special medicine, they get whatever. But I think one of the things about me being out about my status and speaking truth to power has been, people are able to connect with me in, in different ways. At this point, Alvin, it's been 24 years. I'm, I just turned 50. So about half of my life, I've been HIV positive, wow. but I'm healthy. I'm thriving. Now it comes with some stuff. I have people whisper at me in the clubs and, and you know, I've had guys talk to me and then they go somewhere else and their friends tell them that I'm sick, you know, and then I don't see them again for the rest of the, the evening. And wow. it hurts. Yeah. It's not, yeah. it's not fun. I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. in 2022, yeah. we are Real still talk. discriminating against right. people on that basis. But, but you know what? That's not somebody I should want to date anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. Rejection is discernment, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, though. I, I appreciate that because, like I said, I know that you can help somebody by what you just shared with us. Absolutely. And so I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned earlier, obviously, when we talked about your bio and, and the fact that you are a well-educated man who's experienced in a variety of institutions, but you did speak about the Howard experience being a formative one for you. And as I said earlier, as a Howard grad, I personally, um, and I think our viewers would also appreciate what, tell us a bit, little bit more about that. So part of why I chose Duke is because I was aware, I'd applied to HBCUs and PWIs. Um, and you know, my pam my family didn't have money to send me to college. So they were like, you're going to go wherever who gives you money. Right? Right, right. But I knew that Duke had an exchange program with HBCUs. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so for me, it's like, if I, if I go to Duke at some point while I'm there, I can, exp I can have a bit of the HBCU experience. Well, what I didn't know is I was going to have like an amazing experience. You were going to have the HBCU. Oh, it was, it was, HBCU. it was a lot. I, kept, I, I, was, you know, I was living in the Meridian sex palace. I think <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, yeah. You know Ebony, what? Ebony I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. That, that's why you're, you're here. here, okay? That's why you're here. I don't know. Explain. No, shut up, Bob. No, he said he said exactly <laughs> the way he said it. It was on, carry on. Street, right above Malcolm X. Carry it's on, carry on, carry on, carry on, carry on, carry on. Coming. We we know what that was. <laughs> but you know, it's interesting because for me, when you're at a PWI. <laughs> there's so much pressure to conform because it's such a small black community that you can't afford to put yourself outside of that, that box. Yeah. And what I really appreciated about Howard was Howard had all kind of black people, mm -hmm. wealthy black people, bougie black people, bohemian black people. I mean, Absolutely. so it, for the first time in my life, I had a crew of people that, um, that identified with me on so many levels. And interestingly, it was much easier for me as a as a queer person at Howard than it was at, at Duke. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think because I was able to find my people, and because we were in D.C., so we were, you know, beyond what is offered on the campus, we could, right. you know, you, you can find folks. Uh, and and the, the neighborhood around Howard was very different in 93 than it is now. In fact, if I'm remembering co correctly, uh -oh. 93 is the initial Black Pride event. I think it was, that was it was not it was ninety I thought it was ninety six. Was it ninety no, three? It was ninety three before, 93? before that. Sure, okay. Because I remember walking and I saw all these people in the field and then I saw a drag queen and I was like, oh <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, You're not in Kansas that my, anymore. <laughs> that was my introduction to like, and and they were outside. That was my thing. Like they're outside in the open. Yeah. And yeah. I remember the impression that it had on me. But the fact that I got to experience that at an HBCU yeah. 
was so remarkable to me that the professors, the students, I mean, you know, just re remark, I'm absolutely a Howard alum, just like everything else. Mm -hmm. Thank nice. you. All right. All right. So when I say HU, you know what to say, man. You know. <laughs> just just you quickly. Know? There you go. That's what you say. Exactly. <laughs> just quickly, Tim, will you explain what a PWI is? Right, a predominantly white institution, which I have a gripe with, right, because they're not lateral. And this is the philosophical side of me coming out. We say historically black uh, colleges and universities. Right, right. Why do we say predominantly white institutions? If, if we were to make a parallel, we would say yeah. historically white institutions. Correct. Mm -hmm. Let's call it for what it is. These institutions right. were historically white and would not let us in. Right. I was going to say, in right. fact, HBCUs were founded as a result of the fact that they we were, were founded as they allowed. were not as Ed exactly. DeVos said, uh, exactly. what is it, pioneers of school choice? Is no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a euphemism, isn't it? Right. <laughs> So look, Tim, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move the, the conversation on because we're, we're, we're getting near the end and, and I want to share some of your other talents with, 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 with our, with our, uh, with the, with the our talents students. at tracks, the, the, the talents at tracks, the talents at the Delta. These are clubs in DC. You all, y'all heard him name them, but, um, uh, but are they? I've never heard of them. Oh yeah. Right. Uh, sister, I mean, my, my brother, uh, <laughs> right, right. Cause you know, he's, he, Bobby's a nun from seven to eight. Um, on, on the show, right. Um, in, in addition to your musical talents, though, uh, Tim, uh, as an arts innovator, you are working on a pilot, uh, which is called Art, Accelerating Raw Talent Guides, which will provide one-on-one -on -one mentoring between community artists and fifth and sixth graders. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Absolutely. I never get asked about that. So it's exciting for me because I think what we, what we lack and I called it accelerating raw talent because what I saw, I, I remember being at a school, I had a t-shirt with Nina Simone on it with the Afro. And I asked the kids, I said, how many people like jazz? And they all raised their hands. It's a black school. I said, how many people can tell me who's on my shirt? And it got quiet. One boy raised his hand in the back and he says, Michael Jackson. Oh, yeah. And I realized something as great as our kids can sing and dance and play music what the white kids often get is they go through the history of jazz, the history of rock and roll. They learn the people that now they may not be as talented as our black babies, mm -hmm. right? But because they know how to talk about art, how to, they know the lexicon of art, yeah. they're able to position themselves to go further. And so what I wanted to do was sort of create equity in that space by providing one-on-one -on -one mentorship between artists in our community and a middle schooler who can say, okay, if I want to do jazz and I need to know who Mingus is, right? I need to know who, uh, you know, Dizzy Gillespie. I need to know the, the people that I'm talking about. One of the reasons I've maintained a career as a hip hop artist is I can lecture about rap. I can rap. <laughs> I can organize a panel about hip hop, right? And so when you think about people that are able to extend their careers and it's not just a moment, it's because they learn how to do a, a series of other things within their art form. And I, that's what I want all of our babies to be able to do is to, to, to come up and they, you know, they can be executives, but still have a lens and a lane in a way that they can provide a family for themselves. I think we have this notion of the starving artist. Mm. And I was like, I'm not gonna be nobody starving artist. No. Well, you are making this uh, lifelong educator very, very happy hearing hearing this opportunity. That's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. Exposure is everything. Mm -hmm. True. True. Absolutely. So I, I'm, I'm going to, I, I, I know that you're going to be, you're going to perform a little later, but um, I, I do have a, another question that, 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 that I want to ask you um, because you mentioned it. Um, okay. You said that you turned 50 in 2022. Oh, it was amazing. Um, <laughs> What are some yeah. of your um, personal goals for the next season of this journey? You know, it's interesting. Turning 50 was just a moment because when, you, when you're when you told in a desk when you're 26 year old that now. you have AIDS, mm -hmm. uh, and then I had a doctor visit shortly thereafter that was like, you know, if you don't get medication, you might not make it. I, I didn't really think about being 50, right? I didn't think, and I think so many of us don't really imagine our lives into the future, but I'm fortunate to have had mentors and people that sort of laid that path together for me. And so that's what I'm at a point now where I'm like, I get to really create and imagine a life for myself wow. after after 50. And it's it's a beautiful experience. I feel like 50 is young. 
Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to the next quarter or the next two quarters of my life. But I think it does. I mean, I mean, each of you know that I would try to find mentors and people within a certain age. So I very rarely meet my brother that's 65, 70. And when I talk to my friends that are that age, they say, you know what? A lot of my friends didn't make it. Mm-hmm. You know, we lost an amazing generation of talent, of intellectuals. You know, the, the toll that HIV took on, on the Black gay yeah. community is, is immense. Profound. And so I think now that we have better medication, it's, it's my responsibility as someone who has the ability to live, to give hope to, to younger people and to say, you, get, you can imagine yourself getting older. I want them to see, they need to see us. Mm-hmm. And how fabulous mm-hmm. and, and and handsome we are! So, <laughs> you know, know. A- amen to that. Amen, amen to that. Find the okay. lie. That's okay. all I'm asking you. Find amen lie. to that. Hey, look, um, Tim. Like I said, we're we're getting close to the end of the show, and I want to make sure that that we share as much with you as we can. So I'm just going to give you know. Bobby and, and Bosch, uh, and I'm, is, is there another question that you want to ask Tim before, you know, we, we go into a break and he comes back and perform for us? If you guys don't have a question, um, I'm, I have one last question that I want to ask Tim. And I, I, Bosch, I, I think that was a total setup. I don't think he wanted us to ask a question. He has another question and he was just trying to be nice. Well, I always have questions. I have a question for you. I have a question for Vosh. I mean, I have a question. But Tim, Tim is on the question? What's my, your question? My question is, is, first of all, before we do that, let's get to some of these folks that have been chiming in because our viewers are so important to us. They I know, have, and they've been uh, chiming in. They, they've been chiming in. I know Blue, early on, Blue said, what is the, what's behind your name, Timim? Yeah. And yeah, he, he wanted to know really good movie. question. I'm going to I'm going to give you a little homework assignment. So I have a song. It's a hip hop song called Stutter. Um, my birth name is actually a biblical name. It's Timothy. But because of a speech impediment, I struggled to say Tim. M. So it was my family called me Tim and M. And then when I actually use mu- musical theater to get through the impediment, um, I just kind of claimed Tim M. as like my name. And so my birth name is Timothy. Uh, but when you go through the struggles with the speech impediment and you overcome that, I wanted to always remember that. And my little joke is that I'm going to become so famous one day that everybody's going to stutter. Wow. So um, so that's that's where Tim M comes from. It, it's near and dear to me. So when people try to call me Tim or T, I said, no, it's OK. You can say my name. You know, you can stutter. It's OK. Tim M. <laughs> This, this is that. so funny. I swear, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to say because I told them a couple of shows ago that I grew up with a heavy tongue. Uh, because I had a lisp, and and they were laughing about it. weren't y'all laughing? They were laughing. Yes, you were. You were laughing about it. But anyway, anyway, anyway. No, we joined but, you uh, in laughing. <laughs> Tim, before we let you go, I'm going to ask this question because I want to know as well. And we kind of alluded to it, but I need you to confirm it. Are you single, looking, or not looking? The first part of that is easy. I'm single. Okay. Uh, the second part of that is, you know, I, it's tough for me because I, I I want love to find me. Come on now. Talk to I, I don't know that I, I don't know that I trust my impulses. I've made a lot of decisions in the past in search for love uh, where I have compromised my integrity, my values, uh, you know, what's best for me. And so, um, you know, and my sister said to me, she's like, Tim, she's like, the person for you is going to is going to ask for your hand in marriage. So that is a goal of mine. I do. I do want to experience that. But I'm also OK if I don't. I think we place a lot of privilege on, you know, we get that question when you're 50 and single. Why are you single? As if something is wrong with you. So right. what I've resolved is that I'm going to be happy and fulfilled whether or not I have a partner. I would like to share the next part of my journey with someone. But I want to do it in a space of integrity. Uh, where we are mutually supportive with each other. We, we are facing our own demons. So I know I got a lot of stuff that I bring with me and I'm working on that, right? I don't expect someone to come fully together, but I want to know that you know what your stuff is and you're working on that too. And together, if we're both doing it, I think that that, that can be something that can work. So well, if that I didn't answer come... brings some some suitors to your door, I just don't know what way. <laughs> I, I know it's going to Maybe, do maybe not. I, I'm not very much <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, like I said, Tim is going to bless us with with a special performance. But before he does that, we're going to take a moment and share with you uh, an an NNPA PSA from Congresswoman Barbara Lee. We'll be right back. Tim, stay tuned. Hello, I'm Congresswoman.
Congresswoman Barbara Lee, proudly representing California's beautiful 13th Congressional District. I want to congratulate Dr. Ben Chavis, the Board of Directors, and the entire Black Press of America on their 195th anniversary. For nearly two centuries, even prior to the end of slavery, the Black Press of America has been reporting on issues in our community with courage and with integrity. Now more than ever, the Black Press plays a crucial role to inform our community as we fight back some of the same challenges we did a century ago, like voter suppression, income inequality, and systemic racism. Here's to another century of impactful work. We've come a long way and still have a long way to go, but thank you to the Black Press for helping us get this far. Congratulations. All right, well, welcome back, everyone. Well, I'm going to, you know, give the stage to Tim and West, and you take us wherever you want us to go. So well, well, you kind of set the tone for this by asking me the last question. So I think this will be an appropriate way to uh, close things out. And this is a piece from my first book called On Loving. Okay. On Loving, I have little to say beyond anticipations of being loved like this. I have only known how to give the thick kind of love. It stumbles over itself, running too fast, always boils over, finding pleasure in its excess, seduced by the fire next time. Mine is a love that stubbornly desires the ability to smile again, and my shine is a diamond nestled in the belly of ashes, awaiting a commitment ceremony, can't take cloth, Jim Bay's brown people and some other brother brave enough to love like I do till death do us part and I return to the earth the way I was found, patient and enduring. Mine is a cocky love, knowing few limits, reminded that it is easier to make love than make love stick. I have learned that loving hard is the hardest kind of love to get over and that trying not to get hurt gets you hurt anyway. So I am learning to celebrate the way my heart moves and that my loving is like my breathing. As subtle as my toothy smile, simple as my analytics, courageous and inevitable. I celebrate that there's no other way to do it than the way I've done it. Intense like my eyes try not to be. Forgiving like my memory of safety outlasts the weight of longing or sadness. My heart knows an endless depth that echoes its favorite song. My invitation is a shadow that insists on candlelight and a slow dance. And my arms have held men like they would break without my softness. My hands have caressed poetry on the black hand side while they've slept, hoping my impression will be remembered in the event they reject the heaviness of my surrender. My tears well. When I love myself enough to seek, what I have yet to experience, the resolve one has looking into the eyes of another who has decided he will stay and who knows I ain't going nowhere. On loving, I have little to say beyond anticipations of being loved like this. Okay, okay. Okay, Monica, Monica wanted to applaud. Monica, put it up, 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 put it up. Put A it round up. of applause. Oh my God, Tim. Can you cook? Tim. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> I'm going to be in Atlanta in a couple of weekends. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, like, that. Like, like I said, wh do, doing the meeting, I was looking for a plane ticket. Okay, so Tim. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for that, man. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I told beautiful. you all, ladies and gentlemen, I told you all January is on fire. Okay. Oh, yeah. and, and, and right here, oh, yeah. okay, I, 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 I can't put it out there anymore. Tim M, thank you. Thank for you. For joining us thank tonight you. and for this wonderful, wonderful conversation. Um, I, I absolutely loved it. Bosh and Bobby, you guys, you, how you, you feel? Have, you have blessed us and to have done this at the end of your first week of this new gig on top of it. Like, man, uh, thank you so very much. Thank you all. 
Well, I just had one question I was going to ask, but they won't let me. Who don't you like at work so far? <laughs> we're not gonna go yeah, ahead. We told him we're not going to go ahead. No. <laughs> oh, I, I have a question. So when am I coming to D.C.? Like, when are y'all going to invite me? Uh, we'll, 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 we'll talk about that. Let's we'll, figure we'll, that out. We'll, we'll, we'll talk, talk about, about that. that. Well, hold on. Only Bobby and I are in D.C. Vox is in Philadelphia. He's in another city. In, right. Okay. Come yeah, ring my bell. Too. But 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 we but we want him to come to DC. <laughs> the, the, the city of what? The city of brotherly, brotherly love. love. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want him to do that. But ladies and gentlemen, again, for, first of all, j- just just go ahead and click applause. So you guys type yeah, in applause while, while I'm saying this applause, for, yeah. for our special guest tonight. Uh, next week, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be another week of fire. We have with us next week the the author. That's right. A Romal tune, and he has written a book called "I Wish My Dad" on how to have a, how men can have a conversation with their fathers. I mean, this book is so powerful. I have had females uh, buy this book so that they can speak to their sons if they've been separated from their husbands or whatever, because their sons are going through something. It is a great book, but he's going to be here. He's extremely talented, and um, we cannot wait for him to join us next week. And if you all will indulge me, I want to give you all the words of the week. Tim, you inspired this. Uh, They are uh, words by the amazing Cornell West. Um, Never forget that justice is what Mm. love looks like in public. Come on with it. Come on with it. I I am feeling this show. I knew it was going to be amazing. And it it is, (laughs) ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining. To all our viewers, thank you, Sam, Terry, all of you. I can't name all of y'all. I'm really excited. But thank you for joining us tonight on this episode of He Said. Oh, that's me. He Said. (laughs) He Said. (laughs) We'll we'll see you all next week. Lord, you got to put up cue cards in that house, okay? (laughs) Look, I was taken by that poem. I'm in the last (laughs) car. You all have a great weekend, and uh, stay safe out there, all right? Tim, thank you.